everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And today we have gathered here to talk about intercultural learning. Uh, this is the thematic webinar of the School Education Gateway, the initiative of European Union and is a place to engage with European policy and practice for school education. My name is Ina and uh, I'm very happy to support this webinar together with my colleague Asi. So today's focus uh, will be on social inclusion and intercultural learning as key components of the uh, for the effective communication. We'll have a chance today to look into the uh, the whole school approach and point to the tools that can be used for nurturing intercultural competence in the classroom. Um, this will be explained by Isabella Jurczyk Arnold, who is a head of edu education and training at the European Federation for Intercultural Learning. And uh, the second part of the webinar will be dedicated to the practical side. We will be introduced to the European Union and Council of Europe pro joint project in school, which aims at enhancing social inclusion of Roma by promoting inclu uh, inclusive education and training. We have here with us Dennis Durmish, who is currently coordinating the implementation of this project in school as part of the Roma and tra uh, tra Travelers team of the School of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. And he'll be co-presenting with uh, Smaranda Vitek, uh, who will focus on the school level uh, of the project. So this is our agenda for today. And uh, just a quick note be before giving the floor to our speakers is that the session will be recorded and we'll publish the recording on the webinar page as usual. And uh, if at any moment you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the a question and answer box. And we'll make sure to come back to these questions and ask as many questions as possible to our speakers after their presentation. So I hope that every, everything is clear and I'm very excited to listen to our speakers. Um, Isabella, if you are ready, I'm happy to give you the floor. Hello, thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction and for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. OK, I hope you will be able to see it now. So uh, my input focuses on intercultural learning at school, but my main purpose here of this presentation is motivating and helping teachers to take active steps in nurturing intercultural competence among pupils at school. And hopefully we'll get there by, by the end. Um, now, a few words about the organization I represent. So the European Federation for Intercultural Learning is a European NGO that uh, promotes and uh, fosters intercultural learning in different educational settings, formal and non-formal. That means that we have to do with schools, but we also have to do with out of school contexts, associations, volunteer activities. And uh, among our key activities, there are projects stimulating exactly cooperation between these formal and non-formal contexts between schools and civil society organizations. We also uh, run training and uh, develop resources for educators and again for educators in informal settings and for non-formal educators. And the very key uh, interest is international mobility of pupils. Um, and this is the key activity of our member organizations, our national member organizations called AFS. Uh, you can see here the logo. It's, uh, it's maybe a name that you have heard in your countries. The topic of the webinar is intercultural learning. And I can imagine that you have uh, your own understanding of intercultural learning. I think you were also asked to fill in a survey in preparation where you were asked to define intercultural learning for you. And you might have uh, dealt with it under very different headings, different labels. And I would like to share with you some of these labels that uh, exist at international level. So uh, you can see here the uh, OECD, Council of Europe, UNESCO, European Union, so the international institutions that have put different uh, frameworks in place that have a lot to do with intercultural learning. So the OECD talks about global competence and you may be aware of the uh, PISA assessment that was uh, focusing on global competence in 2018. The Council of Europe has the uh, framework of competences for democratic culture and there again intercultural competence is, is very strongly embedded in it, and that also has an assessment framework inside. 
Uh, UNESCO talks about global citizenship and also intercultural dialogue. And finally, European Union oh, has different moments. It talks about intercultural uh, learning, but uh, recently uh, it's the common values of freedom, tolerance and non-discrimination that we hear a lot about. And I can imagine that uh, many of you have uh, different national um, curricula, different national frameworks uh, under which uh, intercultural learning somehow is embedded. Uh, it's also becoming uh, more present, more popular. I think it's more and more recognized as relevant for education. Um, but I would like maybe now to scratch a little bit deeper what we actually mean uh, and why intercultural learning is important. So I have here a little image that you may recognize. Uh, this is something that happened just a few weeks ago in France. Uh, so uh, in brief, uh, um, there was a, a very sad story of beheading of, of a teacher uh, after he showed uh, caricatures of, of Mohammed. And that was followed by, by uh, demonstrations, uh, lots of Islamophobic demonstrations among others. And that again was followed by some demonstrations against Islamophobia. So something that has a lot to do with uh, intercultural dialogue, something that has a lot to do with schools, certainly something very relevant happening. But let me show you another thing here. I don't know if you recognize this. Um, so these are two maps of something also quite recent. The first one is the results of the presidential election in the US in Pennsylvania just uh, a few days ago. And the second is uh, a few months ago, the results of presidential election in Poland. And you may see that there is a lot in common between these two maps. So there is this huge divide that, that you can see. And uh, the divide is not only regional, but there is a huge divide between rural and urban population. So why am I showing these maps here and what does it have to do with intercultural learning? And that's maybe something that is not so obviously looked at uh, in this way. Mm, well, it does have a lot uh, to do with, with dealing with difference and dealing with different worldviews and dialogue between these different worldviews. And uh, this is to say that for all of us, we face this every day and it doesn't only have to do with uh, international or inter-ethnic issues. Intercultural learning is, is something that, uh, that has to do with difference or difference of, of looking at the world. Uh, so the definition that I, that I have here, that is a definition for me, for my organization, Mm, is that intercultural learning has to do with nurturing responsible citizens who can enter into dialogue between exactly between the different worldviews. So into an interaction with people who are perceived as different from, from ourselves. So uh, an important word in this definition is uh, perceived as different. Mm -hmm. So this is something that uh, we also uh, mm, may, might not talk so often about that it's our perception that makes it so relevant, that uh, makes it uh, makes it uh, work, uh, makes it work on the intercultural learning level. Uh, we may think that we belong to some group and we may perceive a different group as something completely from a different planet or different worldview. And this is what I mean by showing these different maps. Uh, intercultural learning is something that doesn't only happen uh, in diverse societies in the sense of international or, or, or multi-ethnic dimension, but it's something that happens in our everyday life in every context and something relevant for every country or every local context that's, that you are in. Um, I want to move on with um, something to help me a little bit understand who you are. Uh, because I talked about the different contexts you are coming from, I understand that, uh, that the listeners here are, are very diverse teachers. So I would like to invite you to, to use Mentimeter. Maybe some of you have used this before. So uh, if you may uh, 
go uh, probably uh, on your phone, so a different device, um, to menti.com and enter the code 626005, so you can see it on the screen, hopefully. And once you enter, once you get in there, you will be able to see uh, a question. And the question is, what's, uh, what is your profile? What kind of teacher or non-teacher are you? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, exit here this presentation and enter the Mentimeter to see the results of your answers. So you will see there uh, the different options you can choose from. Maybe uh, some of these options, uh, there, may, there might be more than one option applying to you. So then please pick the one that applies to you the most. Um, because I would like to see a little bit who you are, who is attending this webinar. So I can see already some answers appearing. So the options here are, are you a language teacher, native language or foreign language teacher, or maybe citizenship education ethics teacher or other subjects. Maybe you're a school headmaster or not a teacher or school staff at all. OK, so waiting still for your answers gradually. I am very happy that there are some some school heads present here that will uh, have importance for some of the other content contents that I will talk about in a moment. And then I'm also happy to see that there are not only language teachers, not only English teachers here. OK. I don't know how many people should participate, so we'll wait a little bit more for your answers. My main message here also seeing uh, who you are is that you came, you chose to come to, to this webinar on intercultural learning, but there is no uh, default kind of uh, teacher or school stuff that has to do with intercultural learning. Usually it's not uh, associated with one uh, school subject, with one person. Uh, it's something that uh, has, let's say, no, no mother usually at school and it's not so clear to say who should deal with it. So I'm happy to to see that we do have a diversity, but it's also not surprising that there are lots of language teachers and I, I can also imagine that many are are foreign language teachers as well. OK, and then uh, I will maybe move on to to the second question. So there are two questions on Mentimeter. And the second question is uh, about uh, your experience uh, with intercultural learning so far. So uh, you should now see on your devices uh, on Mentimeter the second question with uh, possibilities. Have you done intercultural learning activities at school already? Activities with the purpose of intercultural learning? And here I'm asking the first two options are especially with, with the main purpose of intercultural learning, but then there is also an option of intercultural learning uh, happening, but not maybe being the primary goal. Fantastic, I can see already many of you doing things. <laughs> That's uh, very reassuring. OK. So yeah, we said that maybe intercultural learning doesn't have a very clear place in the school, but but it is happening and it may be happen, happening uh, single punctual times, but uh, some of you are passionate about it and, and do it multiple times. And what is also important to recognize is that it doesn't have to be the primary goal of, of activities. OK, I will. Uh, I will go back to my presentation. If I manage to go. OK, so we are back at uh, at my presentation, so thank you very much for your input. Uh, for me, it was also important to see a little bit how much you are in the topic and I'm, I'm happy to see that you're uh, somewhat in the topic already and somewhat involved. Uh, but uh, yeah, the main message uh, here is that intercultural uh, learning and intercultural competence is transversal. It's something happening uh, at school in uh, across different things. So it may be associated with different school subjects from uh, 
naturally some related to language, uh, maybe social sciences, but also until, you know, I don't know, physical education, arts or even science. Uh, as every competence, intercultural competence includes knowledge, skills, attitudes and also values. And in this case, this component of skills, attitudes and values is, is particularly strong. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the framework of key competences for life, uh, lifelong learning developed by the EU. So also there, intercultural competence is embedded across transversally. It's not associated with only one competence. It's just as well in uh, citizenship competence and language competence or social competence, but it's also present in others. Uh, let's say digital competences. If you talk, talk, uh, talk about media literacy, intercultural media literacy is, is a dimension of it. What is also important to say is that it often helps to excel in other competences or sometimes it's even indispensable to excel in these other competences. So uh, it is clear that if we are talking about communication in, in a language, if we are not able to manage this communication in an intercultural setting, taking the intercultural aspects into account, it will not be effective. So it's, it's a component that somehow is, is there, should be there naturally. And because it's transversal, it should also be trans uh, addressed in a transversal way at school with multiple methods, ideally, of course. It doesn't always happen, but, but that's, that should be the case in, in the ideal world. So what are these different approaches, different ways to include intercultural learning at school? Most... Uh, natural or easiest, and that's likely what you have done, is integrating it in subject lessons. So when you teach in your classes in different subjects, you have a chance to do it as, the, as an activity with the main purpose of intercultural learning, as some of you indicated in the Mentimeters that you have done multiple times activities focused on that. But it may be integrated in subject lessons also uh, together with something else, you can uh, you can do an activity in physical education, uh, which focuses on on uh, on physical skills. But then you can also reflect on the activity on the level of diversity. So you can hit two birds in with one stone, or it can also be a very small element in in different uh, subject classes. So I don't know already recognition of uh, contribution of non-Western uh, scientists to, to science is a, an element of intercultural education. Then some of you uh, may be involved with uh, team teaching, so uh, cross-curricular teaching, it's a, a something that is becoming more and more present, especially in some countries. And there you have much more space to deal with intercultural learning uh, through projects, through classes over, over more than one course. Of course, a very natural thing is doing it as an extracurricular activity, some afternoon uh, classes, also outside school, so uh, projects or trips and so on. This is also an element of intercultural learning. Uh, and often these uh, extracurricular activities involve external partners, either involving them inside the school or, or going outside. Then a very important bit which uh, my organization focuses on is uh, pupil mobility. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more later. And finally, uh, there is this, this big word here, whole school approach to intercultural learning. And I'm very happy that we have some headmasters here because um, the whole school approach requires some commitment, some strategic uh, um, focus of the leadership uh, of, of a school, in, including it in a strategy, but also uh, involving multiple stakeholders of the school, involving uh, different activities, not, not only punctually, but regularly, uh, from uh, teaching, teaching methods, to things like uh, communication in the school or, or even arranging spaces in the school. And it's then that the whole, with the whole school approach that it's the most effective. But the good news is that you don't need to be an expert to do intercultural learning. And you have these different options above here on, on the slide. 
and you can do it in small scale. You can do it in bigger scale, and it's worth doing it even if you if you uh, if you don't if you are not perfect. Let's say from from day one. Um, the next thing I want to say about it, OK, you might not need to be an expert, but uh, there are certain methods, certain approaches that are more effective for intercultural learning. And maybe I'm stating the obvious here, but uh, here is a selection of some some of these uh, methods or some of these approaches uh, um, on different levels. So there is experiential learning and that's very key here. So something that includes a, a, a real experience, reflecting on it, on that experience and then uh, drawing conclusions for the future from the experience. Uh, there is a lot uh, about cooperative or peer learning and, and that works uh, very well. Uh, of course, real life encounters uh, in the community, in our daily life, but also then going abroad, uh, mobility. Uh, service learning, something maybe not all of you have heard of, is this idea of, of doing something for the benefit of, of uh, community or, or to address some human needs, and then reflecting on this as well. Mm, and that's why the word reflection here is, is so important. Uh, any experiential learning just requires this, this careful reflection. And then there, there's all kinds of projects that, that can be combined with all of this. And the non-formal methods is like the umbrella uh, word here used. Non-formal methods, of course, can be applied just as well at school. And I talked earlier that as every competence, uh, intercultural competence has knowledge, skills, attitudes and values inside, but it's especially skills, attitudes and values that can be addressed by, by these methods here. So I promise to give you some uh, motivation, but also some tools to do things. Um, so I have something very concrete here to share and something exactly focusing on, on these methods that I mentioned. Uh, this is a website that was developed in an Erasmus Plus funded project uh, coordinated by my, my organization. So in this website, interculturallearning.eu, you'll find a toolbox of methods. There are about 40 methods there assembled, mostly experiential ones that are ready to use uh, methods uh, for you to take and use in, in classrooms. Uh, the website is in English, but the methods are translated also into French, German, Italian and Greek. And uh, they are sorted by different categories you can search. And uh, they are sorted by competence you can search through the competence lens. But uh, here what you can see on this slide is the division uh, by the application context. So this these categories I mentioned earlier the whole school approach, cross-curricular teacher, specific uh, teaching, specific subjects, and then international mobility. I'm not going to show you all the details, so you can explore yourself, go yourself to the website. I just show you an extract of one method, so you can see the methods on the website or you can extract them as PDF. It's step-by-step -step descriptions of, of activities, and usually these are activities that fit into, into the school context very well, so they have very clear objectives as well clear step-by-step uh, -step descriptions. OK, next to these tools, what I also want to talk about briefly is the learning mobility, which we believe uh, in my organization is, is particularly effective because it's uh, immersing learners in, in real situations and immersing them for usually a longer time. And of course, pupil mobility is the, the most natural one. And we are talking about uh, both group mobility, class exchanges. I'm sure many of you are involved in those, but also individual mobility. Uh, when uh, a pupil goes abroad and goes to a school abroad. Uh, so there is short and long term. Short term, uh, usually uh, it's uh, with, with group mobility. But then when we talk about individuals, it's usually for long term. So uh, longer than two months or up to an entire school year. Uh, and OK, we are talking mostly about in person, but there are also virtual mobility initiatives or blended in uh, combining virtual with in person. And these are particularly relevant recently in the pandemic situation. So you can also do a lot of these encounters in, in the virtual world 
and the e-tweening that many of you I'm sure are using is, is a great tool for it. But other than the pupil mobility, we also have a teacher or staff, school staff mobility. So that is just as important because teachers need to develop their own intercultural competences to be able to, to teach them. <laughs> Uh, so there is short visit, study visits, job shadowing, but there is longer teaching assignments and uh, training events or even online courses. And many of these are organized by, by uh, organizations like my own, by civil society organizations, so not only official uh, teacher education providers. And one point I want to make here that you learn not only from sending, not only from going abroad, but you also learn from hosting uh, international mobility. That's something important and, and sometimes easier to organize than, than going abroad. And then I mentioned uh, partnerships. Uh, youth organizations are a, a very valuable partner because they specialize in non-formal methods. So there are different local organizations or international ones that, that you can consider for cooperation. For pupil mobility, I very much uh, recommend cooperating with expert organizations such as AFS. Uh, this is not so easy to set up and expert organizations can be a great partner for it. But then there are all kinds of organizations you can consider locally, uh, different minority organizations, and I don't only talk about ethnic minorities or religious minorities, but different interest groups, uh, uh, I don't know, disability organizations, this is all intercultural learning. And what you can do with these partners, you can do one off things, you can do uh, interventions training, but you can do also projects in local communities. So this service learning, you can do international exchanges, especially with the international organizations. If you invest in it, you can do a long term multi layer cooperation, and that is particularly beneficial. And the good news is that a lot of that cooperation can be funded uh, through Erasmus Plus funding on the international level. Um, I want to finish by a list, a little list of resources. Uh, you can probably later access this presentation and click on the links. So there is the activities that I mentioned already. Uh, there is another database of uh, uh, all kinds of non-formal methods from the youth sector, Salto Youth, uh, some uh, publications on intercultural learning in general. Then there is another publication that focuses on primary school lesson plans on intercultural learning and a study focusing on intercultural competence of teachers. So I finish by saying I recommend you to try to take these active steps. It is fun. It's, uh, it's beneficial for, for teachers as well, not only for learners. And, and don't hesitate to also approach me or other uh, civil society organizations for help. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isabella. It was really, really interesting to listen, and I hope uh, that our teachers and non-teachers uh, will be able to use this approach. It was a really great presentation. And we'll go straight, we'll move forward uh, with our speakers, uh, Dennis and Smaranda. Uh, if you are ready, please start your presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Ina. Thank you, Isabella, for the very nice and extended uh, presentation. Thanks to everyone for joining to this live webinar. Um, and also thanks to Ina and her team for the opportunity to take part in this um, on this occasion. And to also introduce part of the uh, of the work that the Roman Travelers team of the Council of Europe is doing when it comes to social inclusion and inclusive education for um, Roman Travelers children in particular. Now, within our presentation, uh, we will focus on three aspects. Um, one will be uh, uh, focusing on the description of the in-school project uh, and its intervention logic. Uh, the second aspect will also focus on a little bit on the description of the main methodology which is used within the project. Um, and that is the uh, Index for Inclusion, a guide for school development led by inclusive values, which was developed by Tony Booth and Mel Ainscaw. And finally, we will share with you some insights on how the project and its methodology has been carried out at the school level. I suppose this part will also be interesting very much to our audience now. And for that purpose, my colleague Smaranda, which is uh, in-school facilitator from Romania, will, will help us and uh, give us and share with us um, 
uh, her experience uh, with the work with the schools and within schools from Romania. Now, a little bit about the project um, in school. What 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 is in school? In school, in school stands for inclusive schools making a difference for Roma children, which is a joint project of the European Union and the Council of Europe. The general aim of the project is um, enhancing social inclusion of Roma by promoting inclusive education policies and practices in targeted countries. Now, some of the um, object, specific objectives of these projects, which are particularly relevant for the local practice level, are related to setting up support mechanism and resources for schools, providing support to teacher to practice inclusive teaching. Um, some other objectives of the projects are related more on the policy side or to the institutional barriers and are related to supporting the removal of concrete barriers for vulnerable groups of children, including through changes of legislation in target countries, as well as raising awareness of the benefits of inclusive education for the general public as well for the decision makers. Now, although the in-school project has the duty to monitor the situation of Roma children, among other um, categories of children which are living in vulnerable uh, circumstances, the project in itself does not target Roma children specifically, but rather focuses on how the entire school population interacts, um, interacts, um, how the uh, how how um, the school respect, uh, what is the respect uh, among each other, uh, the acknowledgement of each other, and how the results are influencing sustainable um, uh, uh, and inclusive development. Now, as suggested by the uh, Index for Inclusion, the interventions which are also supported within in-school are mainly values-based, uh, meaning that we focus on putting values into actions. Now, we generally refer to this aspect of our work as being inclusive, but not exclusive. Now, a little bit about the project. Um, the, the project was initiated in 2017 with the pilot phase uh, implemented in a, a specific cohort of schools until July 2019. Now we are in a second phase of the project, which was initiated in October 2019. Now, the current targeted countries uh, under this phase of the project are Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia and Romania. Now, it is worth mentioning that it is a project working both on at the practice level, meaning in a selected cohort of schools in each country, and at the policy level, which means in cooperation with relevant ministries and institutions in charge and education in each of these countries, as well other relevant institutions within the education system. Now, it's also it's also good to to portray how this project is connected with the larger um, setup of the Council of Europe, meaning how is it connected to the larger policies. Um, InSchool is inscribed in the wider Council of Europe strategy on, um, uh, on uh, social inclusion of Roma and travelers, mainly the, uh, as a specific uh, priority on quality inclusive education and training as part of the strategic action plan for Roma and travelers. Now, the project also makes connections with the framework of competencies for democratic culture. Now, this was also referred by Isabella in her previous, um, in her previous uh, presentation, which is basically a set of materials uh, and guidance that can be used by education systems and institutions to equip young people with the competencies that are needed to take um, to take action to promote, to defend the uh, human rights, democracy, uh, and the rule of law, and essentially to live in peaceful, um, peaceful uh, societies, uh, to, uh, in peaceful uh, and culturally diverse societies. As part of this larger landscape about the, the in school and uh, the Council of Europe, it is uh, it is worth mentioning that inclusive education is among the main pillars monitored by the Council of Europe's monitoring bodies, referring to European uh, Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, the Framework Convention for Protection of National Minorities, and some others, 
but also a close attention to this topic on inclusive education is uh, given by the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights. With this slide, I'd like to present a little bit about the intervention logic uh, of the project and what happens at the practice level, meaning what ha happens at the level of the schools. Now, since the beginning of the project in 2017, um, the, the in-school project has been working on the basis of the Index for Inclusion uh, uh, methodology, which is a guide to school development led by inclusive values. Now, it, that is a very flexible tool that allows schools to advance at their own pace, define their own priorities, depending on each local context, need, circumstances, environments, and so on. Now, within the project, we have involved around 31 schools, and each of them follow the index development planning cycle. In each school, there, is, there are similar but genuinely different processes which derive from the needs and vision for positive change in general from the school, from the teachers, from the students, parents and other local or stakeholders which uh, educational or interest group that are um, interested to um, uh, on, uh, on you know, in the area of inclusive education or in education in general. Now to elaborate a little bit on the scheme which is presented with the slide here and how in school actually is being carried out uh, at the level of the school. The, as, an, as number one of this slide, this is this represents the in-school uh, team of facilitators and educational advisors, which support school through regular interventions and visits. Sometimes this is uh, two or three visits on average, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the stage of the implementation cycle. But the in-school uh, facilitators and advisors, they also support and monitor the implementation of the index cycle. They support the schools in building up the school development plans. They support them in preparing the grant applications, which are based on schools' own priorities and needs, um, which are defined or better called, they are negotiating, negotiated within the schools. With each school, there is a, a so-called coordinating group established. This is number two from the, uh, from the slide presented, which involves teaching and not teaching staff, um, pupils, parents, and other local stake stakeholders, could be an NGO, could be a representative of the municipalities, and so on. Now, these coordinating groups reflect on um, their own, they reflect on their needs, the challenges and the opportunities within the school. Um, but in general, they discuss and negotiate the change they want and need to bring within the school with the help of the proposed set of indicators and questions included in the index. Now, the, these coordinating groups, they also define together the inclusive school development plans, which sometimes can be a short term document, sometimes can be a long term document or for several years and so on. Now, based on these school development plans, um, the team or the schools also uh, engage in preparing grant applications, which are developed by the schools comprising of activities um, in line with this inclusive approach or value value based approach. The activities are then meant to support the positive change that schools and school environment uh, would like to see or strive to. And um, they are financially supported by the in-school project through a grant. Now, this is in brief the intervention logic of, of in-school, uh, which, which follows the index development uh, cycle. My, my colleagues Maranda will later present a bit of more specific what actually happens within the schools uh, and, and share her experience from the school, working with and within the schools in Romania. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that, that um, in-school also works on the policy level. So there is a, a continuous communication uh, between what happens at the practice level and what happens at the policy level. So we call this two-folded or dual approach, which compels us to keep an overview of the education policy and practice in each country. Now, to achieve this, the in-school facilitators work directly 
with the schools, meaning with the teachers, the students, the school staff, even with the parents and so on. And on the other side, in school advisors, they ensure that the process is nationally coordinated, meaning that they also pay attention and support the work within with the schools, but at the same time, they coordinate and maintain the systemic feedback communication with relevant policy um, policy institutions. Now, the slides portrays this um, uh, this cartoon uh, portrays a little bit of how we see it and how the project communicates. Now, to be more concrete, um, we keep a close communication and cooperation with the ministries in charge of education in each of, our, of the countries where the project is being implemented. Now, this communication is secured um, either through um, specifically established, we call them national working groups, which is um, the case for Hungary and Slovakia, or through already existing policy coordination entities within the ministry themselves, which is the case in, uh, uh, in our case in, uh, uh, in Romania and Czech Republic. Now, the intention of this cooperation is to communicate about existing gaps and inconsistencies between the policy and practices in schools, but also to explore ways and opportunities in providing better support and better services to schools and the other way around. The experiences and results from in schools project happen at the school level, which happen at the school level, are regularly communicated and they serve as the basis for the policy discussions with the ministry. And this path portrayed in the cartoon slide um, needs to portray this continuous and regular communication. Now, I would like also to mention two uh, very tangible achievements that we managed to, to, to succeed on the basis of the experience uh, experiences from the pilot phase, which is basically the in-school um, team from Romania have been successful at the policy level to support the development of the Ministry of Education methodology on school segregation monitoring in pre-university education. Now, this methodology is now endorsed, actually was endorsed at the end of 2019 uh, by the ministry and is largely inspired and uses a wide range of indicators listed in the uh, index for inclusion. Now, currently we have a similar situation in Slovakia where there is an attempt of modifying the legal and policy framework for defining school segregation and the experiences of the in-school project from the school, school level from Slovakia are contributing to the ongoing debate and the policy discussion which are currently led by the Ministry of um, Education in Slovakia. We have mentioned that um, the index is the main methodology that is followed and promoted under the in-school project. Now, I'd like to dedicate some time to promote this tool and approach as might be of benefit to today's audience and future viewers. Uh, starting with the notion that, uh, that the schools are involved in many activities to promote um, their development, INDEX helps to bring all this together into a single approach, a single tree or a single flower petal, which draws strength from its own roots. Now, the materials within the, in school, with, uh, within the index uh, is um, in the guide is structured in three dimensions for development of cultures, policies and practices. The dimension A, which focuses on creating inclusive cultures, focuses on the relationships, uh, which are deeply held values and beliefs. Um, changing culture is essential for uh, sustaining development. Uh, dimension B of the index focuses on producing inclusive policies, which is related, which is concerned with how the school is run and um, the plans um, and the plans to to change um, to change it. Uh, dimension three of the index focuses on evol in evolving inclusive practices, which are about what is learned and taught and how is learned. At, and taught. And each of these dimension has specific set of indicators here portrayed under A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And then the index 
in each of the indicators, there is a, 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 a list of questions, of critical questions, which need to help um, the practitioners, teachers, and everybody that is using the index to better refine and better develop their activities um, to lead towards ch uh, change um, uh, sustained and uh, uh, from the perspective of, of uh, sustainable development in education. Now, the indicators are also, the indicators and questions invite reflections of what inclusive values imply for activity in all aspects of a school. It's in environment and communities. Now, together, uh, together with the questionnaires, um, these materials provide a future means to build on what is already mentioned as including development plans. Uh, now, I'd like to perhaps mention of how to how we can use um, the index. Now, one way of using the in index is to start from a shared commitment to put to put inclusive values into action. Something that we also promote and it's the core element of our interventions that leads to our development of a comprehensive and inclusive development plan produced or carried out in collaboration with all those within and around the school environment. We have mentioned previously in the presentation that the, these coordinating groups involve the, 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 the community within and outside of school. So this could also involve people or institutions which are in the surrounding of the school environment. But it's also interesting that the index, it's, it's very useful and it can also focus on a single aspect of a school or even the work of a single teacher. Now, we invite the audience perhaps to access the, uh, um, the, the to access the, the website of the um, uh, uh, dedicated for the index for inclusion, which is uh, available here. Uh, and perhaps to, to test the usability and benefit by exploring the indicators and the question section of the index in a single aspect of their work. Now, I took this part, um, this, this uh, indicator, just to make an illustration of, of how this could be helpful uh, and uh, how this could be helped. For example, each of the indicators or aspiration for development um, is clarified by question which tie down its meaning and provide ideas for development. In this case, presented in this slide, is the indicator about children are encouraged to be confident and critical thinkers. As you can see, there is there are lists of questions that can help teachers and education practitioners to to deeply reflect about an ongoing issue uh, and perhaps even to expand. As you can see, the, 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 the instrument or the, the indicator, um, it's also um, adaptable. So basically you can sh show that you can add your own question. There is no limit to the questions that you, you, do, you can ask. And this is done with the purpose to improve their own work and transform um, their actions into results which are based on inclusive um, values. Now, at the end, before I pass the floor to Smaranda, just very briefly, I'd like to mention a couple of the uh, results that we have been able to um, conclude as part of the pilot phase of the project, um, meaning that the in-school uh, approach was uh, highly appreciated by schools and gave very positive results in school in all over the countries uh, of implementation during the pilot phase. We also noticed a wider involvement um, of decision makers or stakeholders uh, 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 at the school level. There was um, evidently improved relationships among teachers and pupils. And um, there was um, also improved uh, there was improvement of the school pre premises the, there was there were there was a certain level of um, of uh, of um, uh, improvement of of the school environment in in order to make it more friendly and acceptable for 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 children now 
Uh, it, a last thing that we also want to mention uh, is that within this, um, within the pilot phase, we also have uh, experienced improved teacher skills through targeted teaching training. Uh, this on topics which the coordinating groups identified themselves, allowing them to attend and to, to participate in full staff um, teacher teacher training. I will stop here and I'll take you. Thank you for your attention. I'm at disposal for any questions that you might have, and I would like now to pass the floor to Smaranda uh, in order for her to share her experience from the project implementation school level in Romania. Thank you, Dennis, and good evening, everyone. I'm happy to participate in this webinar with you professionals uh, who are open to find out about our project. Thank you, Dennis, for inviting me, uh, to all of you for being here, and to Ina and Asi for uh, the organization behind this uh, meeting. As you can see, uh, and now you have an overview of the implementation of the in-school project in Romania in the pilot phase, and I will continue to focus on the index cycle and how we have gone through it. In the pilot phase in Romania, six schools were involved, and in the second implementation cycle, three more schools. So now we have nine uh, inclusive schools in uh, in Romania involved in uh, in the in-school project. Throughout the process, as an in-school facilitator in Romania, my intervention involved direct work during the pilot phase with two schools and later during the second cycle of the implementation with three schools, a new schools was involved. Uh, and uh, while for one of the first two only methodological support I provided, my intervention as facilitator was focused on acquiring the methodology proposed by the Index of Inclusion implementing it at the school level, creating coordinating groups, identifying with them priorities, developing grant proposal, proposals based on the needs identified and supporting the schools to implement the grant activities. Starting with May 2018, I provided regular support on average two to three visits per month in each school, as Dennis already told you. Uh, my objective was to assure quality inclusive education approach at every step of the process. It means revising of the institutional development plans, definition of priorities and activities, conducting consultation with stakeholders and conducting activities supported through in-school grants. During the in-school uh, project, schools institutional development plans and operational plans were effectively improved and revised through a participative method ensured by the Index for uh, Inclusion methodology. And uh, at the end, the two instruments became action plans of the schools for a longer period of time in Romania for five years per each school and the wider scope of action than the financial support provided by, uh, by in school. Related with the Index uh, process, which Dennis told you about, the first phase, as you saw, uh, was uh, starting the evaluation based, based on the index. That meant, mean, meant first establish and develop a coordination and planning group. This group started as a group led by the principal of the school or by one of the young and very involved teacher and another five or 12 motivated teachers who wanted to get involved voluntarily. And we started to discuss about significance of the index approach and to review the approaches to school development. We clarified the common understanding of the terms and we started to analyze the indicators and questions in the index. Uh, in my schools, yeah, as you can see, my schools, because I'm very attached to, to them, um, the coordination group decided to work in a big group formed by 11 to 13 people for the next steps of um, the implementation of the project. It was a proof of commitment and motivation because it took a lot of, uh, of time of engagement. In the second phase, we have started to gather information about the school, about the attitudes of different groups. We organized small groups discussions with teachers, with students and some parents. In this stage, the parents were not so much involved. Uh, some of our discussions continued in an informal space and were more relaxed 
and the teachers in particular developed the feeling of belonging to the group and began to exchange uh, ideas with, uh, with each other. Well, after this uh, phase of consultation, identifying uh, uh, priorities, we moved to the next phase of the index cycle, elaboration of a development plan for the level of school inclusion. So the coordination group started to work with the index for inclusion and to identify index indicators correlated with their priorities in their schools. This was the starting point to set a new framework for the school institutional development plan for the next five years where the priorities, their priorities were included. In the fourth phase implementation of priorities in educational practice, well, starting from this institutional, institutional development plan for five years, they also developed an annual operational plan to meet the identified priorities. Uh, for each year, they develop a new operational plan to help them implement their priorities. The consultation process was important because the, um, the coordination group made a draft of the institutional development plan that was presented in the teachers council to all teachers who had the opportunity to complete with what they considered necessary. In became their document and they attached themselves to their mission to transform the school into an inclusive school. Well, about more about implementation in, in one minute. Um, the last phase of the index process, uh, it referred to review the index process and continuing the index process. In, um, in, this, um, in the second cycle of the project, for example, one school decided to revise, to totally revise the inclusion institutional development plan again. Um, and uh, the, new, the new school involved in the project started the process from, from the beginning. We are continuing in this moment the index process, implementing priorities, developing uh, a new grant proposals, a new grant proposals, and um, we develop these grant proposals on the new needs identified. And we are supporting the schools uh, to implement the grant activities in the, uh, in the next uh, month. Well, uh, please to the next slide. It's, oh no, it's okay. This one, it's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis, for helping me. Well. Uh, related with activities implemented by uh, by schools through uh, the in-school grants involved, these activities involve most of the teaching staff and uh, all of the student body, including Roma children and also children with disabilities, children from other minorities, children in extreme poverty and children whose parents have migrated abroad. All the three schools um, I work with reported having included Roma children and parents in their grant uh, activities. Uh, the Romanian team organized also national workshops with all the schools and peer-to-peer -peer exchange, uh, exchanges, study visits among uh, schools. Uh, a very important part of their uh, activities uh, was the training of uh, teachers. There, this training of trainings of teachers were conducted as part of the grant proposal and at least 20 teachers per school were trained in relevant areas, ensuring the cohesion of the teaching staff in terms of vision and understanding of, uh, of inclusion. One of the main outcomes of in-school has been visible at school governance level. Teaching and non-teaching staff understand better the principle of inclusion, apply them in their everyday work, and relationship with children, parents, and co-workers uh, are better, are improved. For example, one of the school reported an increase in parents' involvement in, uh, in school activities. One immediate result, as I told you, it was the improvement of the interpersonal relations uh, among teachers, between teachers and their students, between students and uh, between, I don't know, the school uh, as a whole and the parents. Uh, the activities that require cons consultations with all these educational stakeholders are more visible and they are implemented in a friendly uh, environment. The improvement of the schooling environment had a direct impact on reducing, for example, absenteeism of Roma children, on the involvement of Roma uh, students in regular extracurricular activities, improve also, um, I don't know, the teachers became more aware of the non-discriminatory attitude towards students and parents. Um, and, and yet in school, it turned out to be a project about healthy relationships between all, all these uh, stakeholders. 
uh, how do they build these relationships through training courses and mentoring. Uh, students were challenged to help each other to do better in school. They clearly define goals um, accompanied by many other acquisitions that uh, cannot be quantified in, in numbers, but uh, only observed uh, as a result of this mentoring uh, um, relationships. During the meetings with the parents and within the teachers council, moments from the developed themes were exemplified and the progress of the students involved in the project was discussed. Images from the activities, as you can uh, see some pictures and material resources were followed. It is observed as a result of the involvement uh, in this project, a better functioning of uh, the relationships uh, between, uh, between people. And uh, it is possible to move to the next slide. OK, uh, in my activity as facilitator, uh, together with the teachers, with the parents and with the students, we realized that it was uh, for all of us about experiential uh, learning and above all about being together in unity. We realized how important it is to know the history of a minority, to be able to empathize with their pain and suffering, uh, to be happy for their achievements. In the end, um, we set together the tone for the relationships between uh, people and we understood how important it is to all speak the same language, to treat everyone correctly, regardless of the ethnicity, right, you know, religion, uh, skin colors, mean in, mean in fact, to treat ourselves, uh, ourselves properly and to respect and love each other. I learned success stories with them from which uh, I learned that ambition, perseverance, hard work can move the mountains. And uh, actually we realized together that we have a major, major mission to support children from national minorities in achieving the proposed, uh, the proposed ideas because many of them do not have enough confidence in their own uh, strengths that one day they can become what they want. And um, I will wait for uh, your questions if you have now or later because uh, you'll have my email address and we are ready to OK to thank you for your uh, attention together with Dennis. Excellent. Thank you so much, Maranda. Thank you so much, Dennis, for such a great introduction of the project and also the insights that you've shared. It was very interesting. Um, so as uh, we are already actually running a bit out of uh, time, uh, but we'll still try to address a couple of questions that has been um, posed during the presentations. One question is, um, could you perhaps give an example of what uh, what is used for online training? Because right now, obviously, it's uh, extremely important to know the exact tools that you've been um, using so far. Thank you. So, of course, there is uh, different things that you can consider as online uh, training for teachers and different things as online learning for uh, pupils. But uh, I think I can imagine that the pupils is, is the, the bigger concern right now. And uh, I think what is what is beautiful right now is that with the remote um, learning that schools are in experiencing locally, uh, it becomes a norm for pupils to, to interact through the screen. And that opens a possibility of interaction through the screen also with, with their peers elsewhere. So what you can do, you can, you can have uh, virtual encounters between uh, classrooms in different countries and uh, here again I recommend eTweening as uh, as a tool to, to use to, to facilitate those. It can be a course uh, run together but it can be also just exchange and dialogue uh, of course uh, if it's if it's framed uh, well by the teachers and then of course there are there are uh, specific modules that you can run uh, with pupils online as well on specific topics related to intercultural uh, learning, yeah, so this could be a, a longer topic which I don't have time to go into. Excellent, thank you so much, Isabella. Um, and we have one more question regarding the in school project. Uh, some people were wondering whether the school can join or apply for the project. Could you please, Dennis and Smaranda, explain if that can work? Thank you, Ina, uh, and thank you for the question. Um, for the moment, uh, we are operational um, in uh, four countries, um, uh, and uh, the second phase is already running. Uh, we might be expanding the cohort of schools uh, within the countries, I think in Romania and Czech Republic and possibly Slovakia for these school years. 
However, we are working on the extending the project and hopefully with the next school year from 2021, perhaps we can even extend the, uh, num uh, the number of the countries, the targeted countries. So perhaps in that regards, we can also include additional countries and school within the project. However, we have shared our contacts. So anyone that is interested about participating, learning from the, our experiences or sharing some of the educational materials and tools, they are very well welcomed to contact us and we will be happy to, to share some of these findings um, with anyone that is interested. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to thank everyone who participated in this webinar. A special thanks to our speakers. Unfortunately, we don't have more time to elaborate more on the questions. Um, it was really, really inspiring, very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing the, the approach that you have been implementing so far. Um, so uh, we will draw this uh, webinar to the end um, and I would like to point out uh, one practical question that uh, uh, is very important for the audience. Uh, yes, you will be able to obtain the certificate of participation. Uh, what needs to be done to, to uh, receive the certificate? So first of all, uh, you can submit the evaluation form within 40, uh, 24 hours and we will leave the link uh, as an announcement in the question and answer box. Please make sure to save the link uh, so it does not disappear uh, when the webinar is over. Uh, please make sure to also be registered on the Teacher Academy uh, School Education Gateway account and be logged in. So this is very important. So this is how you'll be able to uh, receive certificate once you submit the evaluation form. So once again, please make sure to save the link that we have just published in the question and answer box. Yes, this is uh, this was the practical information and also next uh, actually this week we will continue the talks on a social inclusion. We'll have another webinar. Uh, which you are very, very welcome to participate in. The webinar will be indicators for inclusive systems in and around schools. So uh, please join us this Friday. We'll be very happy to see you there. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much to, um, to Isabella, Dennis and Smaranda. It was really great and very inspiring. Thank you so much to our audience to be with us today. And I wish you a wonderful evening and a great rest of the week. Thank you and goodbye. Okay.